So thanks uh, again so much this week for joining us here on Thousand Words. Uh, I couldn't be more excited this week to have Mitch Kizar along. Um, Mitch is absolutely one of the legends in the photography world, especially in the outdoors industry where where I work. Uh, but Mitch, Mitch has been uh, around the world many times. And like he told me uh, in a phone call uh, a couple months ago, he feels like he's changed careers nine times. So Mitch, I really appreciate you coming on today and uh, joining us for this episode. Glad to be here. Oh, and, and Ozzy's glad to be here too. <laughs> nice. The one of the one of the Jack Russell celebrities gonna gonna probably join the uh, the yeah. fold here too. Uh, she, uh, she heard a squirrel. She's out of here. <laughs> For those who don't know you, there's probably not a lot, but um, so many of your images have shown up. If anybody's into the outdoors in hunting and fishing and uh, any outdoor lifestyle, they've they've undoubtedly seen your stuff. But, you know, rewind, you know, back to the beginning of your career and, and just tell us, uh, you know, of all of these career changes, I mean, they've all been photography related, but give us kind yep. of the, the Nichols tour for what this what your background looks like. Well, I had a young newspaper guy I did a story on me last year when I had I had my 50th, uh, oh, let's call it a celebration. And mostly it was just burned a pig underground and invited all my neighbors over. <laughs> and and he thought it was a story. So he came over and, and uh, started talking smart. And he just sort of labeled me as a storyteller. And I guess, you know, after his interview, that's probably pretty much it. That's, that's what I started out doing when I was in 4-H and FFA. <laughs> was telling stories with a Polaroid camera and writing up a two paragraph thing and dropping it off at the newspaper on the way home to milk cows. And uh, for some silly reason, they would run them almost verbatim and publish the pictures. So I'm in a school library looking through the paper and like, holy moly, there's one of my pictures. Well, how cool is that? Can a guy make money doing this? Well, turns out, no. <laughs> <laughs> but let's do it anyway. <laughs> He says 50 years later. Yeah, 50, 52 years later now. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a long road. But anyway, yeah, it's, uh, my journalism storytelling story started off in 1969. I got hired as a newspaper writer. And uh, and then they stuck a camera in my hand and said, here, you're pretty good with that Polaroid. Let's see what you can do with this thing. Uh, have I got time to get it? Yeah, that'd be cool. Go okay. grab it. So when I worked for the Thief River Falls Times and then a whole pile of years later, it had to have been in the early 90s. So I was just finished up a project for National Geographic and my old boss was somebody that I really liked a lot. And I called him up and said, hey, what are you up to? And he said, let's go goose hunting. And I'm like, well, okay. He said, I got the boats, dogs, kid, everything. Just show up, bring your stuff. I'm like, sweet. So I showed up. We got down with that and he's got some geese. He says, uh, "Hey, let's go. Uh, let's go do a uh, interview with you." I'm like, "For what?" He goes, "Well, you used to work here, you know. I just want to tell tell your story." So I said, "Fine." So we're sitting in his office, and pretty soon he's over in the closet digging around like a badger after gophers, and he pulls this out. <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, that's the one you used to use, man. I thought I've been saving it for you all these years." <laughs> sits in my kitchen now that's awesome yeah so, so, so uh, some, I used some to of the go people shoot looking at that are going you know how many megapixels is that but that was the uh Ooh, that was the way of the world when you were a lot of pixels in the black and white tri let me tell you <laughs> that's awesome awesome yeah i used to go shoot football games in the snow with this thing and um uh, four by five film overs big big fat pockets full wow very cool yep. And then when I went in the Air Force, I was a combat photographer, and they gave me another one, um, and then a bunch of smaller ones. And that was sort of at the time when we were going from big format to medium format. And mm -hmm. I was the first one in our photo lab in the Air Force to drag a 35 millimeter camera into the shop. And <clears throat> there was a minor war over that whole deal because that wasn't big enough to be serious. And we said, well, if Alfred Eisenstadt can shoot coverage for Life magazine on this camera, same camera. I think we can probably handle it. I won that fight. What uh, What was your What was your experience with the Air Force? I was a uh, my 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 uh, MOS was a two three six five one seven one, but it was a still still combat photographer was what it was called, and the only combat I saw was in uh, in the states because I was supposed to get shipped to Vietnam three times. And the 
for some fluky reason never did go. Hmm. But my job, had I gone over there, would have been to just flying flying jets and document everything. They we it's just like a newspaper job. Yeah. You, you do everything. You do ceremonies, you do grip and grins and check passings and yeah. murders and all everything. It's just the, the whole gamut of life. Somewhere in this window now, you must have been in Montgomery, Alabama, because the first photo that we're going to talk about is a is a yep. very powerful, heavy, heavy image. And you were working, um, you were working for the newspaper in Alabama. Yep. I had a I had a kind of a unique situation. My uh, base commander was all about doing career advancement stuff, and I went to him and I said, uh, "Hey, at the base here where I'm at right now, I'm kind of a 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. guy." And that was our normal, our normal daily routine. I said, I have an opportunity to work downtown. They want me. Um, I work two to 11. I won't let it interfere with my Air Force duties. And he goes, well, if it'll help your career, do it. Hmm. Really nice guy. Colonel Weber. Anyway, so, <laughs> so yeah. I was down there working two to 11. And uh, the night of the image you're talking about, Matt, was uh, uh, we had police scanners in the dark room down there. So it was like 11 or 11. 15 at night or right at the end of the day and a uh, call came across the scanner that there had been a drowning at the holiday Inn downtown well i was only a couple blocks from there so i went grabbed up my stuff and tore down there uh, two or three policemen down there with a big long pole and they were poking at, at this guy at the bottom of the pool and laughing about oh people of a certain uh, pigmentation can't swim and about the time I popped that shot, I looked off on my right and an EMT came tearing across my vision and dove in underneath that diving board there, peeled his radio off and threw it, dove under the pool, pulled the guy up, got him up on the edge of the pool and started doing CPR and brought him back. And those guys had been poking at him for, I don't know how long it was, 20, 30, 40 seconds, maybe a minute even, I don't know. Anyway, the EMT brought him back. And I didn't know what to do because I was pretty green in the news business. And all I thought was what my boss had told me is that you smell a story, you get in there and do it and go. He says, your job is to get in jail. My job is to get you out. So I thought, well, there's license right there. So I, went, I followed the EMT. I jumped in the back of the, EMT, the, back of the, of the emergency vehicle with him. And I rode all the way to the hospital, which was a good mile away. And um, the guy flatlined and died as they were pulling him out. And um, then I'm thinking, now what do I do? I don't have any money. I never had any money. And there are no cabs running. So I just gumptioned up and ran the whole mile and uh, uh, whatever it was back to the paper, got to the elevators and they were just shutting down the city desk. John, John Williams was this big, long, tall city editor. Kind of reminded me of Jimmy Stewart. And uh, he says, Kizar, what, what's going on, man? You're all sweaty. I said, well, I, I just told him a story. He goes, seriously? And I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, you go upstairs and you make me a wet print and you get it to me ASAP. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something. He says, you are never gonna hear this again in your entire career, but I'm stopping the presses. Hmm. And he did. And that picture ran that big on page one. And by 10 o'clock the next morning, all those cops had been fired. And in the ensuing days, that's, a, that's when <clears throat> the bomb threat started. And, we had to lock down at the paper. Everybody had to, you know, tighten up security. And I got death threats at home. And all, all of that, all of the fun that went with it. And what that did for me professionally was it just taught me the power of an image. It taught me the power of uh, how an image can tell a story, even if it's technically not great. It just does it, mm -hmm. and it was credible and it was honest. And I was there. I heard what I heard, and I'll stand by it till I'm I'm dead. Some people don't like having like shined on stuff. So there you have it, you know? Yeah. It, it was a contentious time, I would imagine, especially in that part of the country at that time as well. I don't know if it's any different than this week. And I was just going to say, here we are this many yeah. years later and we're yeah. kind of dealing with it again. It's and I, and I feel the same. It's like I, when that was going on on the 6th January, I tell you what, it was boiling up inside of me. I was, I was upset. I thought, I thought we're better than this. Yeah. When was the, when was the first moment that you kind of realized the gravity of what you had just captured on film? And maybe it wasn't oh, right away, yeah. right away. In fact, once, once uh, that gentleman got loaded in the ambulance, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I was like, ah, I got to get out of here. 
this isn't yeah. good. Yeah. Bad things can happen. It, and the, I, you know, that was like one of many, many, many things like that, that happened down there and in that, in that era. And then I went from there to the Tampa Tribune and I was with the Tampa Tribune for probably seven or eight years down in Florida. And, um, when I left, I was in charge of the photo staff. I had 37 shooters working for me and I had worked uh, for a year. They pulled me in to edit, uh, copy, lay out pages, do all that stuff. They wanted me to have that experience so that when they made me director of photography, I had a working knowledge of not only how it all went together and the timing, but I also had built a relationship with all of the other editors in the newsroom so that when I said something, they generally would give me an ear. You know? Sure, sure. The, um, you know, this, the, the, the whole concept of the thousand words and every story, you know, tells that there, it's always nice. And on Instagram, we get to, we get to look at the nice stories and the happy stories and the ones that make you smile and feel good. But, yep. you know, I th when, I, when you first sent me that image, it, it was a quick reminder that not all the, not all the images and all the stories are ones that, that make you want to double tap it with a big red heart on it. It's uh, you know, there, there's some, like I said, some serious gravity to that image. And it obviously puts you in a place that, you know, established your credibility and your um, just who you are, but it's a, it's one of the stories that, you know, of the many that you have to tell and, and uh, just not one that's. Yeah, another, another thing interesting about that little episode was that was before the, that was before I got cognizant of the, the contest era. Right. If you will. Yep. yep. You know, the years following that were kind of fraught with, uh, you know, journalists of all stripes. And I think it's pretty indicative of a lot of professionals is you just want to get recognized for what you're doing. So you're entering contests and so forth. And, I always had a, here's the best contest I ever won. <clears throat> I was working in some little rat hole in North Florida and uh, going around and I saw this lady out in the yard doing something. I can't remember what it was, but I stopped to make a picture of her. It was a feature picture. It was just a cutesy picture, you know, something to fill with page two, three, four, whatever, just slice of life, right? We were big on doing slice of life stuff. And uh, I stopped and talked to her and she was hotter than popcorn down there. She asked me if I wanted a uh, lemonade. And I said, I, I would love to. So she says, well, you come on in. So I went in there and I got in and sat at her kitchen table and I looked up on the refrigerator and there's five of my pictures had been cut out. I don't know her from Adam's house cat. And five of my pictures are hanging taped to her refrigerator door. I said, um, what, what's the story here? She says, wow, those are just, those just make me smile. <laughs> I said, they do? She said, yes, I, they do. I said, well, thank you. Those are my pictures. And she said, well, I like your style. <laughs> That's great. The ultimate compliment right there. Well, if you can make grandma's refrigerator, as they say down in Alabama, you done big. <laughs> So how, how long did you find yourself in the, in the newspaper business of writing and taking pictures? And you ultimately, I mean, you made your way to Minnesota and Thief River Falls. Uh, just give us kind of the backstory on what you, what well, I left a, I was in charge of the photo staff in Tampa for about two years. So that would have been 80 and 81. And uh, then I had, <clears throat> I had been talking to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, which was a very big shouldered big honking paper and, and uh, you know, even, even in Florida, I had, I had pretty big responsibilities with 37 shooters. We were covering pretty much the whole state from Tallahassee to Miami, but I also had photographers in Cuba. I had photographers working uh, in Yucatan and so forth. And um, so that helped when I applied for, or they wanted to interview me for the job in Minneapolis because the star at the time, um, they were a world newspaper. They were not just covering Minnesota, just Minneapolis. It was a world paper. So they wanted somebody that had experience with international uh, wrangling and so forth. So I came up to the Twin Cities and I, I went from a staff. It was interesting. I went from a staff of 37 to a staff of, I think it was seven. And a whole lot more money. <laughs> wow. You had to do and, more. Uh, and like seven. Well, this is, dude, this is one hand tie behind my back. But not, not really, because I had shooters in Africa, Norway, uh, South America, El Salvador, all the same week. And then my job was to like make sure they get back straight, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And 
but uh, they were very good at it. They're all the all the people they hired were just top top shelf. It was a blast working there. And I, I stayed there till late in eighty or middle of the year in eighty two, and then I got to bug to freelance, and they were getting ready to trim staff anyway. So uh, that was right about time they merged the papers and such. And mm-hmm. um, I I I wanted to freelance for a long time. I'd started shooting stock photos for Tony Stone back in nineteen what was it seventy two or something like that. So the stock photo business was on, on my radar as well. Yep. And that, that served me pretty well. So in Tampa, I, organ- I reorganized the entire way they were storing pictures because they couldn't find anything. When they shot it, it would be, it'd be like going through this garbage pile of negatives and they'd be lost. And I, I, so I, I spent a little bit of time organizing that whole deal. And then when I got to the freelancing part of the world, I started organizing all my own work. And then a few years later, um, started Windigo Images sure. and we had 330,000 pictures on that site now and I haven't lost one yet. <laughs> Amazing because you're not looking for negatives. You're, you're just working with keywords and well, they're all technology has done, ama- <laughs> yeah, done amazing things. Um, yeah. What have you, obviously you've, you've run the gamut of, of technology all the way back to the four by five days and you, you were an innovator then as you were trying to get, get you know, cameras smaller and work with stuff smaller. And you've obviously moved all the way now to the, to the forefront of the digital world. What, what would your 30,000 foot view in retrospect of how technology has changed photography? What would your answer to that be? Uh, I've watched my, I've watched pretty much my whole career. People have fight it. Um, and I'm more of the ilk where I'll be an early adopter. Hmm. I'll, I'll get something and learn it before it goes into the mainstream. And I think a, that'll make you broke real quick because it always gets cheaper later. But at the other side, you're, you're ahead of the curve on, on uh, not playing the catch up and the clients all know being, you know, having worked for myself for since what, 82, um, clients all know I'm, I'm not dragging behind on technology. Yeah. And, and if and- I am, it isn't very far. Yeah, and the, the the reality of it, you can you can still embrace the romance of wanting to shoot on film, but the reality is to to stay ahead and to get hired and to produce content. Now you yeah. you better stay at the forefront of this, or you're not going to get hired. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not missing film a bit. Film's just another four letter word starts with F. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, I mean to, to back that up, I was probably the first. We were, I was the largest user in the twin cities of polychrome. I don't know if you remember that stuff. <laughs> yep. 35 millimeter polar, yep. right? Crank it through, shoot 12 and process them and look at it and see if your lights were going off or whatever. Right. And uh, that was back when I was doing a lot of annual report and corporate photography, that sort of thing. And now the digital stuff is all you chimping on the back all the time, you know? So in the, in that transition to freelance, is that when you maybe would, would say that you sort of hit your sweet spot where you got to go back into the things that you were, personally passionate about not that you weren't passionate about news and things like that chasing that around for all those years but you're an outdoorsman you you know you said you grew up with well it, and yeah give it, being a freelancer fish. gave me license to do what i wanted to do to a large degree and pursue avenues that worked for my head right so i i uh, you know i did a lot of work for everybody i shot for uh life magazine time and newsweek fortune forbes business week family circle women's day um, New York Post or New York uh, Washington Post, New York Times. Those were big clients for a number of years. And that's just chasing hard news. That was not any different than what I'd been doing. Right. Run to beat heck. Only difference was you'd shoot it on some kind of chrome, coat of chrome, ectochrome, and run it to the airport, find a pilot, give him an envelope, and say, hey, "Here's going to be a dude at at the gate when you get there. Here's fifty bucks. Can you deliver it?" And he's, yes, sir. That was, a, that was the early internet. <laughs> Your early Wi-Fi adapter. That's what I was just going to say. Your early Wi-Fi adapter. Yeah, and, we went from Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi. <laughs> and now we're running around with them in our hands and you're sending them right from the camera. It's crazy. Yep. Yeah, crazy. it's pretty nuts, man. But So how, how about your, the, you know, I mean, the, the outdoors thing. I mean, we could sit here and flip through images that you've shot for every big client that anybody that's ever held a fishing rod or an, a, a a gun or a, a bow or hiked in the woods has, has seen your stuff. As you look back at all of that, um, what are the best, you know, the, re- the rewards that you've 
kind of reaped or gained just through all of these years of being able to do, you know, have, have the, the confluence of your passion in life, as well as what it ultimately ended up being your, you know. Yeah, that was a perfect were. marriage of, of uh, right place, right time, right uh, intuition, right energy level and the ability to, to pull it off. And, you know, as one of my assistants said, damn, you never quit. I'm like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. let's keep going it ain't dark yet and yeah. uh he's like uh, he came up to me one day dennis nolan was his, is his name and yeah he said uh, i'm never gonna forget how i was done an hour ago and you're still out here whacking away it's like well it, sometimes it gets better sometimes it's worth it and that, that night it did it worked out pretty well but yeah. anyway long story short it's uh it was a it was a kind of a perfect storm of of um all the right tools coming together at the right time and and a driven to want to do it yeah but it was also great because i mean i i made more darn friends doing outdoor stuff than anything because we're all you know all right we're done working what let's plan a hunt trip <laughs> for sure and i you think know? that you know you said initially that you're a storyteller i would consider myself the same and i think when ultimately the stories you're being asked to tell are the stories you would be telling if you were just sitting around a campfire anyway you just happen to have a camera and a company right. or brand that's paying you to do it those those stories end up being the authentic ones and the real ones because it yeah. you know like i've said it many times it's like this is what i do it's just i just happen to have a camera and i'm able to kind of tell the story along with right. it so yeah it's like you brought up the picture of my jack sitting behind the spear yesterday yeah what am i gonna, am I gonna not shoot it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah heck no man <laughs> well the the other image that we wanted to talk about and it's 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 great because your uh, your kids had asked you you know some of your favorite images throughout the years about the time that you and I talked about having you come on and do this project. So it was good because you had already been searching through hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images and thoughts and memories, but um, you had come up with a you know a whole handful of them that were all very poignant in, in their own way and very diverse. Like you said, you shot for Women's Day in the Washington Post and the you know, the Air Force, and it's been a very diverse career, but the outdoors has been one that has, has really, you know, treated you well. And you've obviously, you know, been a legend in the outdoors space. And the, this next image that we're going to look at is, is one of a, of a lab. You said you were a lab guy that downsized to Jack Russell's, but this lab, um, there's a story here of, of a whole bunch of things that you can tell if you're ever a, a waterfowler or a goose hunter, you've probably seen something like this, but tell us a little bit about what's happening in this image. We were on a shoot in Missouri, I think it was. Yeah, it was on the breaks in Missouri and we were duck hunting and it was uh, setup time. So we're field hunting. It's a little bit muddy and a little bit cold. Um, guys are getting in layout blinds and they're all gathering up their corn stalks to stick in their layout blinds and get, get everything uh, primped and ready. And they had their dog in the dog hut and he was out where he could see really well and do everything and I was just thinking oh this is cool I'll just sit here and make a picture of old Chase because he's just a good old guy you know seasoned old Labradors nothing better man those guys are just they're, they're all business yeah and they're all business <laughs> <laughs> and he's in there and I'm you know what I shot that on I shot that on this little dinky like a camera it was about this big little tiny thing and I'm laying down in there and uh, working on him and he's all of a sudden it's like i have said a thousand times if you stay awake long enough it'll happen and the kaleidoscope comes together and all those little colored glass beads just tumble into shape and pretty soon pop 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 three or four guys in the background are doing the perfect thing and a brace of ducks comes flying over top and chase is like Whoa. one frame it's over man yeah, we need one frame. Right place, at the right time. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So luckily that shot made a two page spread in field and screen. I was pretty lucky that year. I think I had four. Those are called their first shots. You know, they're like a double truck. Yep. Yep. A staple down the middle. And uh, yeah, I had four of them in one year out of a whole world of pictures. So I was like, that was probably my best year. <laughs> huh. That's awesome. Well, it's a beautiful photo. And I think there's you know, there's emotion to it. And, and obviously with the, the, anybody that's been around dogs has a, there's something that tugs at the heartstrings there, but it, it to me, it kind of, that dog chase uh, sort of has that just like, you know, everybody's frantically running around getting things ready and I'm just going to 
I'm just going to chill here until all the things come together. And like you said, when, when the time was right, it was all business. I'm sure for chase as well. Yeah. I know if you've ever had a, if you've ever muffed a shot and you look up and a duck's still flying and your dog looks up and goes, Bozo, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, great. Really good at this. that's great stuff you, you know you mentioned that little Leica camera there you've brought out the big polaroid talk about um just some of your favorite things through the years what it doesn't have to be the the biggest megapixels or the the longest lens or i mean now you're shooting a lot of video and doing video projects what are some of your favorite things that you've adopted you know on the front of some of these uh these initiatives that have come out for technology. What are some of your favorite things looking back? How about gear? Yeah, just gear and techniques and things. Um, would you consider yourself a big gearhead or just somebody that's tried to have the right tools at the right time? More, more B than A. Um, I, I don't love my cameras. I went to a seminar with Sam Abel, who was a Minnesota photographer that worked for National Geographic for a lot of years. And he gave me one of the better quotes. He said, I hate my cameras. I hate them. Mm -hmm. And I was at that point where I was kind of coming up in the world and I really like my cameras. I'm, I'm like, these are my babies right here. Yeah. You know? And you hate your cameras. I'm like, explain yourself. He goes, they get in the way. Hmm. They get in the way of me putting on film what I see. And I still think about that a lot because it's like they do get in the way. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mechanical device that if you aren't the master of it, it'll, it'll tear your moment to pieces. Hmm. So when you talk about having an affinity for gear, I think I have an affinity for learning the gear. I, I have an affinity for being a wider, quick, quick on yep. the six. Yep. You don't want to think, I don't want to think. I want it to, I think early on, I get all set, get every little parameters together and video is way worse than stills. Once you get that going and then you, then you can be a picture maker. You can be an image maker and a storyteller, but you got to get to where you don't hate your camera so much. Right. Do you think um, with the onset of the crazy technology and things that we have at our disposal now, um, do you think there's, it gets in the way more now than it did before when you had manual focus and manual film advance and all those things, or is it all relative to what's happening now? I think you still have to be able, I know you still have to be able to see. I mean, you can give one of my cameras to anybody on the street and what are they going to do with it? Mm -hmm. uh they'll stand i mean i'm not picking on anyone but they'll stand right there and let a great shot walk right by them they don't even see it you know yeah. you gotta stay awake it's like that part of it and then the other part is <clears throat> i think there's a certain amount of technology that is good but good god you, I, I never used to sit around and fiddle with menus for 15 minutes before mm -hmm. i got going in the morning and now they do so much different stuff but we're asking more of them too. We're asking them to do stuff that's just a quantum leap over what we did 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'm setting color balance in the camera and we used to have to sit around and I don't know, maybe it isn't any different. I mean, I'm not, I haven't used a color meter in years, light meters. Who needs a light meter anymore? I, yeah. I just put mine away a minute ago. I was. There yeah, the more technology, maybe more problems, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, back yeah, they're the a day. blessing and a curse. You know, I got an R5 Canon right now, and it, that thing got animal eye focus. It's crazy, oh. isn't it? Dude, it works, which is yeah. really sick. <laughs> yeah. And we used to, you used to have the, you know, split in where you were manually trying to line things up, and you were, yeah. I, I remember the first time I held a camera that had a, had a motor drive in it. I just, I, I couldn't, Whoa. I just couldn't yeah. believe that it did all of this without having to, you know, f manually advance and, so, I mean, I think as time has moved on, it maybe doesn't get in the way anymore. It's just, there's more stuff, but like you said, the expectation is, uh, is higher. There's more stuff that you need. Yeah. To and then once you're, once you do get it set, it's a, it's a nice party. Cause it's, if you, yeah, if you get it all set up, right. It, you can fly. Yeah. I, mean, I look at what some of the guys are doing or guys and gals are doing and I'm like, Whoa, that's just crazy. Good stuff. Yeah. And I don't, I don't bemoan the fact that, you know, they didn't go through the film and all the crud I had to go through. I don't care. It's like, yeah. can you see or not? Exactly. The art of seeing, that's what it is. Yeah. So what, uh, what's next? I mean, what's on the horizon? Do you see yourself? What do you see two years, five years, 10 years? What, uh, what things still drive you and make you excited about what you're Maybe doing? I'll be 80. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, 
like lit up right now about just some personal projects, which are just starting. Um, and I, I'm still on a blast. I'm, I mean, I'm shooting commercial job down in Arizona in two days. And there's no, uh, there's no real retirement in this business. And I've said, people have asked me that, like, when I would, you, yeah, you, well, I, you know, I retired in 1970. That was the last time I had to milk a herd of Holstein. So it's like, you know, I haven't worked a lick since, man. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Well, like we we're saying, when the confluence of what you love comes together with what, what, uh, helps make you money, it's a, it's a beautiful life. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's not all about money because it's not just, just enough to get by and... relationships. And as my friend Tony says, good food, good drink, good friends. Well, Hey, I, I just so appreciate you taking some time. Uh, like I said, at the beginning, you're, you're one of the, the legends in our business and in our world and a guy that I've looked up to for a long time. And I know a lot of people that will watch and listen to this. Um, will just love to hear kind of your behind the scenes and some of some of what makes the images that they've seen Mitch Kizar produce over the years, um, you know, what they are and, uh, you know, just many more years of great image making from you and storytelling. And uh, we'll certainly share your, your website and your Instagram and all those places that who would have thought when you were working in Montgomery, Alabama, you'd be having an Instagram page or stuff like that. But uh, I just really appreciate you coming on to share some of these stories. Well, I uh, look forward to crossing paths again, and hopefully we can get well, together. Oh, we gotta get together, Matt. I mean, come on, dude. Get out in a spear house or find a project we can do together. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't have to work all the time, you know. It can be one of these personal projects where we maybe find a place that they intersect. Yeah, there you go. I'm always up for a little collaboration. That'd be awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much you know, for your time. And take care, brother. Okay. Take care. See you, Matt.